Good day and welcome to the Ministry of Health's virtual media conference, which is your trusted source of COVID-19 information in Trinidad and Tobago. With us today are Dr. Miriam, Miriam my apologies, Abdul Richards, Principal Medical Officer of Institutions, and Nurse Grace Sukchand, who is the manager for the expanded program on immunization at the Ministry of Health. I am Candice Alcantara, Manager Corporate Communication at the Ministry, and your moderator for this morning's conference. We go straight to Dr. Richards, who will provide the clinical update. Good morning. Thank you very much, Candice. To my colleague, Nur Sukchan, from the expanded program on immunization. Good morning to all members of the media who continue to participate in our Ministry of Health conferences as we collaborate to provide information to our population on the COVID-19 pandemic. Good morning to all persons who are tuning in in Trinidad and Tobago and internationally across the various forms of social media and other types of media. This morning, my presentation will be in two parts. Firstly, I will provide a summary of the Ministry of Health's dashboard number 997 as of the 11th of February 2022, and then a summary of the status of the parallel healthcare system regarding the hospital occupancy and the number of patients in this system. So I'll now move on to the dashboard update number 997. There were an additional 963 cases of COVID-19 confirmed. This takes the total number of active cases to 21,267. Regrettably, six persons succumbed to this virus, taking the total number of deaths to date to 3,507. We would like to express our sincere condolences to the relatives, friends, and loved ones of the deceased. Regarding our population's vaccination status, at present, 49.8% of the population is fully vaccinated. So ladies and gentlemen, we are almost there at the halfway point. And my colleague, Nil Chan, will share more information regarding our vaccination drives. Regarding the patients who are in hospital, yesterday there were 425 patients hospitalized. And in the next segment of my presentation, I will provide further information on the hospital statistics as of this morning. It is key, however, to note that we continue to see a significant proportion of persons who are not fully vaccinated requiring hospital care. And this indeed has been a consistent trend since July of 2021. So at present, approximately 84% of all persons hospitalized in a parallel healthcare system are not fully vaccinated. And this of course emphasizes and reiterates the need for all of us who are eligible to become vaccinated. I'd like to now shift to the update on the parallel healthcare system as of the 12th of February, 2022. And this information was collated at 8 a.m. this morning. The overall occupancy of the parallel healthcare system this morning is 47%. And this represents 416 persons of which 342 are in the hospitals in the parallel healthcare system with 74 in step-down facilities. Despite the decrease in hospital occupancy that we have been noting over the past 53 days or so, we must recognize that the hospitals that care for the severely and critically ill patients continue to have high occupancies. So overall, we are seeing less patients in the system but when we review where those patients are being treated, it is at the hospitals such as the Coover Medical and Multi-Training Facility, the Augustus Long Hospital, the Arima General Hospital, the Point Fortin Hospital, where the care is of 
you know, a higher acuity care, as we would say, so for the more severely and critically ill patients. This morning, our ICUs have 37 patients out of an available 80 beds. This gives an occupancy of 46%. And in our accidents and emergencies in the traditional healthcare system, there are 39 patients this morning, of which four are at ICU level. Ladies and gentlemen, we noticed a trend um, of increasing hospital numbers that was confirmed on or about October 19th of 2021. That is approximately 117 days ago. The peak occupancy occurred between the 21st and the 23rd of December, and this occupancy reached 81%, which of course was above our critical zone, our critical threshold in the parallel healthcare system. Since then, the hospital occupancy and the a and &E admissions have slowly declined um, up until today, we are now, as I said, at 47%. And this decline took approximately 53 days. Over the last week, um, six days or so, we have noted that the hospital occupancy has decreased to under 50%. And today, after 117 days of this trend, we have noticed the lowest hospital occupancy with these 416 patients. We have also noticed the lowest ICU occupancy, 37 patients, representing 46% occupancy. And a similar trend is noted in the accident and emergency departments where there are 39 patients this morning with four ICU level patients. Yet again, a far cry from the 200 or so patients that we were seeing in the last two weeks in December. So ladies and gentlemen, we have been noticing a downward trend in our hospitalization. However, as we would have noted with this very unrelenting and uncertain virus and with previous waves, we do settle, we do see a plateauing, and then due to circumstances such as a new variant, we see again an increase in the hospitalization, which puts our health system under strain. This virus is extremely uncertain. Globally, countries continue to struggle and to battle with meeting normalcy and reaching normalcy in light of this pandemic. And we are seeing a lot of changes globally in different countries. The certainty around this virus is regarding treatment and vaccination. Firstly, we again at the Ministry of Health and again as myself, a physician, would like to appeal to persons to please seek treatment early in the course of your symptoms. Do not delay treatment because reliance on treatment at home or reliance on treatment that has not been confirmed or approved by the Ministry of Health puts you at a distinct disadvantage when eventually you need to be admitted to an accident and emergency. So give yourself and your relatives a chance. Please seek medical treatment and the appropriate medical treatment early. The second proven and certain intervention has been vaccination. Nurse Sukchan will speak to you at length about vaccination and in some more detail. But in summary, we have all been vaccinated for different diseases, starting with the MMR. We have all been vaccinated to attend school. The COVID-19 vaccine is no different. It is safe, effective, available and accessible to all those eligible in Trinidad and Tobago. Vaccination reduces the risk of you transmitting the COVID-19 virus. It reduces the risk of you sharing and transmitting this virus to those who cannot be vaccinated at this point in time, such as young children 
and persons who may have uh, immunodeficiency disorders and are already very ill. And vaccination, most of all, reduces the risk of you requiring hospital treatment, especially in an ICU and an HDU setting. The final intervention is one that we have spoken to you about and that you all are aware of, and those are the public health measures. Let us continue to wash our hands, watch our distance, and wear our masks properly. Thank you very much, Candice, and I now pass over to you. Thank you very much, Dr. Richards. And as you know, the Ministry of Health has again put out the call to parents to encourage parents to ensure that their children are fully vaccinated and adequately vaccinated. So we are very pleased to have with us today Ms. Sukchand, who is the manager of the expanded program on immunization. And as Dr. Richard says, she's going to go further into this topic. So let's go to her to get some very important information this morning. Thank you, Candice. Good morning to Dr. Richards. Good morning to members of the media and to you, the viewing and listening public out there. So this morning, I'm here once again, just to discuss a little about our immunization program, our national immunization program. So can we go to the next slide, please? So the National Immunization Program is really a public health strategy and program for improving children's survival by directly combating key diseases that can kill children and by providing a platform for other health services. Next slide, please. So what are some of the reasons for getting vaccination? Why are we encouraging persons to get vaccinated? Vaccine saves lives. Vaccine preventable diseases are still out there. So although we have vaccines, there's always a risk that these diseases, if we are not mindful, could once again raise its head and start spreading. Vaccines do not just protect the people getting vaccinated, they also protect everyone around them. And let me give you an example. There are certain vaccines that persons are eligible for, children especially, at a particular age. That means until they reach that age, they are at risk of contracting the disease from another person who are unvaccinated. The more people in a community vaccinated, the harder or more difficult it is for a disease to spread. If a person infected with a disease comes in contact only with people who are immune, that is persons who have been vaccinated, then there's little opportunity for that disease to spread. This type of protection is what is called, or we refer to as herd immunity. Next slide, please. And this is a picture of our national immunization record card. And the reason I put this slide up here is so that we could look if we look at the back of the card, it tells us what vaccines are available for persons at the particular age group. Very important for us this morning is looking at the vaccines that are required for children from birth until five years of age. So if you look closely at the first vaccine that is administered, we start at two months of age. And at two months of age, a child receives their first vaccines of diphtheria, pertussis, tetanus, hepatitis B, hay influenza, a pneumococcal vaccine, and then a polio vaccine. So our DPT hib hepatitis B is what we call a five in one. So that's what we refer to as our pentavalent. It's five vaccine in one shot, basically. And then we give our pneumococcal vaccine and our IPV, which is a polio vaccine. IPV meaning inactivated polio vaccine. At four months, the child comes for their second dose of this vaccine. And again, it's the same set of vaccine. At six months, the child is now required to get their third shot of the same group of vaccines. However, they no longer receive an IPV or an inactivated form of polio, but they receive the oral polio, which as persons refer to as the drops that we give the children. 
At 12 months of age, a child is now eligible for the measles, mumps, rubella or MMR vaccine and the yellow fever vaccine. Only at that age is a child eligible for this vaccine. At 18 months, the child is then required to get a booster dose of their vaccines. And this would requ require the DPT or diphtheria pertussis tetanus vaccine, oral polio, and of course, a booster dose of our pneumococcal or Prevna 13, which is the vaccine we currently used. At two years of age, a second booster of the measles, mumps, rubella, or MMR vaccine is re now required. Previous to this period, persons would have been getting this MMR vaccines between the period of four to five years. However, WHO and PAHO has advised that the vaccines can be given at an earlier age, and this was done in light of outbreaks that was happening uh, in 2018. So in 2018, Trinidad and Tobago adjusted their age to two years of age. At four to five years, the child is now required to have a second booster, and that is your diphtheria pertussis tetanus or DPT vaccines and an oral polio. At this point, the child is considered fully vaccinated for school and would have received all the required vaccines to enter a primary school. And this is one of the, this is the vaccines that we are really paying particular attention to. If you continue looking at the list of vaccine and the schedule that is up on the screen, you will see that at nine to 12 years, the child received a booster of tetanus or TD. Now, this is usually when the child is preparing for SEA. And then at nine to 12 years, we start the HPV vaccine, human papilloma virus vaccines. And between the age of 11 to 15, the child can have two doses, one dose, and then six months later, the second dose. However, if the child is over 15, they are then required to have three doses of the vaccines. And if we look at the other listing for adult vaccination, we will see that the immunization program not only uh, is scheduling vaccines for children, but throughout the lifespan. Next slide, please. If you look at the inside of the card and why we are showing the inside of the card, so it's easy for parents to see that again, the vaccines are listed at the particular age group when the child requires it. If you look, it's color coded, so it makes it very easy to see what vaccine is required and what period of time. If you are not sure of what vaccine your child is due for, please contact your nearest health center or your pediatrician and find out whether your child needs to have any updated vaccines. Next slide, please. Now, of grave concern to us, and Minister would have brought this issue to the attention of the national population on Wednesday press conference. And he mentioned the fact that we had some concerns with respect to our measles vaccines. And that is in light of the fact that we are having outbreaks globally. So if you look at our vaccine coverage for the last three years, we saw in 2019, at the beginning of the COVID-19 pandemic, our, our coverage for the first dose of measles, mom, rubella was at 99% and for the second dose at 92%. In 2020, we maintained our percentage in the 90s. We had 91% for the first dose of MMR and 90% for the second dose of MMR. If you look now closely at 2021, we can see that our percentage have dropped significantly. The measles mom rubella coverage is now at 89% and the second dose of the vaccine is at an alarming 83 percent next slide please so what are the factors that can lead to an outbreak being a young unvaccinated child is one of the basic biggest risk factors for contracting 
any vaccine preventable disease and for developing complications. One other factor is lack of access to vaccines. The vaccines are available at all 109 health facilities in Trinidad and Tobago. So there's absolutely no reason why a child cannot access the vaccines. We have adequate vaccines at the national level. Another factor is parents or guardians not taking their child or their children to be vaccinated. And that seemed to be one of our biggest challenge today at the, the health facilities. We are making the vaccines available. We are giving persons appointment to visit the facility. We are calling persons to remind them of their misappointment. And still we find that our numbers have dropped and we find that parents are not bringing their children out to the vaccines. Another factor that can lead to an outbreak is our low coverage in the population. As, as you can see, our coverage for measles vaccine is under 90%. Next slide, please. So measles outbreak, as I've mentioned before, are occurring in every region of the world. Measles can enter our country, including Trinidad and Tobago, any country, by infected travelers entering the country, infected persons traveling through other countries, infected travelers returning from other countries, and we are listing some countries here below where we currently have our break. India, Nigeria, Somalia, Pakistan, Democratic Republic of Congo, Afghanistan, Yemen, the United Republic of Tanzania, and Ethiopia. And you may find, you may, you may say to yourself, these countries are so far away from us. But we must be mindful that we have people traveling in and out of Trinidad and Tobago. Trinidad and Tobago is also uh, a halfway point for persons to stop on their way on to another country. Next slide, please. So let's talk a little about measles. We know that measles is highly infectious. How? Because one person can infect up to 18 other people and the virus floats in the air for up to two, maybe in some instances, four hours when an infectious person has been. What's worse, a person is infectious three to five days before the onset of a typical measles rash and one to two days before the onset of fever. This means that a healthy looking person can go around spreading measles and not even know that they have the disease. Next slide, please. So what are some of the strategies that Ministry of Health and all the public health facilities are currently using? We are booking appointments using block the block system so that at no point in time the health facility is crowded with children because we are aware that we are maintaining the public health guidelines. So we are actually operating to ensure that you and your children are safe when you visit the facilities for the vaccines. We are calling persons via phone to confirm your appointment the day before you are to come in. We are calling persons to remind them of the appointment or rescheduling their appointment on the day they're supposed to be there. We realize a specific time has passed and we are not seeing the children coming out. So sometimes we call, what is happening? You were supposed to be here at 10 o'clock. I'm not seeing you, it's now two o'clock. And then sometimes we get excuses like, oh, I forgot. Um, can we reschedule? We go ahead and we facilitate that. When all that fail, we are also go going one step further. We are conducting home visits. Nurses are actually packing vaccines in coolers amidst the other uh, the pandemic and going out there to ensure persons are vaccinated. Next slide, please. This is just a picture to show you what measles look like. And as you can see, it's a rush that spreads and it can, be, it can spread throughout your body and it can be very painful and difficult. Next slide, please. So we want to ask ourselves some questions. How many of us had measles as a child or knew someone who contracted measles? Do you remember the pain, the discomfort? Would you want your child to experience that pain and discomfort or worse, develop complications that can lead to encephalitis or swelling of the brain? 
or even death from a disease that can pre be prevented by vaccines. And that's basically my presentation for today. Thank you very much, Candice. Thank you very much, Ms. Sukchan, and we really appreciate that quite comprehensive uh, presentation. And I know there are parents watching the conference, and I hope that those who have not gotten their children vaccinated um, adequately, I hope that these parents take the step um, to have that rectified as soon as possible. We go into the question and answer segment, and as standard practice, we ask our media representatives to indicate your name and the name of the media house that you represent before posing your question or questions. We ask for no more than two questions, please. If we have additional time, of course, we will come back to you and field another question from you. Please ask both questions at the same time, and we ask you to be brief so that we may field as many questions as possible from your colleagues. We begin with questions from 103 FM. Let's hear your questions this morning, please. Panel, Rai Rikomas from 103.1 FM. Uh, given that there are so many doses left of the Pfizer vaccine in stock and they're expiring at the end of the month, is the ministry, what is the ministry doing regarding potentially donating some of them? The other question is that a few visitors and foreigners have reached out to us at the newsroom regarding proof of ID for safe zones. For some of them, their passport alone is their form of ID. However, some are a bit reluctant to keep that on them at all times. Will they, the visitors, be allowed to use a photo of their passport when they're in a safe zone, much in the way that a photo of your vaccination card is allowed? Thank you. Thank you very much. And we go to the panelists for response. Dr. Richards, you want to start us off, please? So I will speak about the ID question that you had for visitors. And it is acceptable for them to have an electronic um, form of their passport, their passport page with the biodata information. I'd like to now pass on to Grace for the discussion regarding the Pfizer vaccines, please. Thank you, Dr. Richards. And with respect to, yes, we do have quite a number of vaccine, Pfizer vaccines in stock currently. However, as you are well aware, it is expiring at the end of this month. So it's too short a time for us to donate vaccines to another country. Thank you very much. Let's go to AZP News, please. We are ready for you at this time. Hi, good morning. Swan Wyo from AZP News. My two questions are doc to Dr. Richards. Dr. Richards, you would have mentioned several things over the past few press conferences, one including that the patients have been seeking care a little bit too late, which resulted in patients being admitted to the ICU and HDU. That was like about last year. Now there's a decrease. What contributing factors can you say may be the reason for the death increase, decrease and the hospitalization decrease? That's question number one. And also you mentioned that you all would have recorded when patients refused care. Uh, do you have any reports as to approximate number of how many patients would have refused care either from the ambulance services or when they arrived at the hospital? Thank you. Thank you very much for that question. There are a couple of variables that are involved in the number of persons or the decrease in the number of persons at the accident and emergency and the decrease in the ICU and HDU numbers. Firstly, we now have Omicron as the established variant in our population as compared to the Delta variant. We also have an increase in the vaccination uptake, but more importantly, the Omicron variant globally has been noted to be less virulent, but highly, much more highly transmissible. So persons are contracting the virus, and we would have noted that in the increased numbers and the high numbers, for example, yesterday's numbers, but they are less likely to become ill and to seek, require medical attention. Secondly, um, we've also noticed, noted that persons have been coming in at an earlier time to the accident and emergency. Uh, we have not been receiving many complaints from our physicians, and this is a good sign, and it shows that there has been some compliance to the recommendations that we would have been putting forth. 
Um, the other question pertained to the actual number of persons who are refusing care in the accident and emergency department, or sorry, when the ambulance service um, arrives for them. That number is tallied on a daily basis by our ambulance transfer team, but I do not have the accurate number for a given time period. However, you can uh, request this information through the Corporate Communication Department of the Ministry of Health, indicating the actual time interval that you would require this information for. So thank you very much for raising these two questions, and I hope this has been useful. Thank you very much, Dr. Richards. Guardian Media Limited, let's hear your questions, please. I think we're waiting on Guardian Media Limited. Just give me a sign if How's everything's it? all right there technically. Yeah, everything is fine. It took a while to, for them to unmute Wonderful. Me. Um, Hi, good morning. Morning. Um, I have two questions, of course. Um, I want to find out what does the Minister of Health attribute to causing the downward trajectory of cases over the past few weeks? Because earlier, um, Dr. Abdul Richard did say that he, they've noted a low um occupancy in hospitals and ICU. So what do you all attribute to that? And um given the no daily uptake in COVID nineteen vaccine, uh is it still feasible to continue running mass vaccination sites? Um is that something that the ministry is going to continue? And those are my two questions so far. Thank you. Let's go to Dr. Richards please. I won't say that there's been a significant downward trend. What we have been seeing would have been fluctuating numbers, again, as a result of the testing patterns and the days of the week. I mean, we did see a high number yesterday, and um, of course, we've been seeing some 500s in the numbers. We would have seen a couple into the 300s. But overall, we cannot become prematurely comforted by these numbers because there are several variables that would impact on the actual um, figure that is placed forward on a daily basis. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Richards. And the second question, I believe, the feasibility of maintaining mass vaccination sites. Go back to Dr. Richards for that, please. The presence of mass vaccination sites is really determined by the actual demand um, regarding the type of vaccine that is being administered and the population that we are looking at. So in a way, it's a bit of what we would call a health network analysis. We look at the size of the population in the given area. We look at the number of vaccines that need to be distributed, if it's with children between the 12 to 18 age group, adults, boosters, etc. And we look at the uptake. So there are a lot of trends that are reviewed in the Ministry of Health to consolidate and to reallocate resources to identify vaccine sites. Of course, as I would say with the hospital beds and um, you know, what I've been repeatedly saying over the past eight or nine months, resources are limited. And it's the same pool of doctors and nurses who would work in a vaccination site that we may lean on in hospitals in the parallel healthcare system or to do surveillance and testing out of the CMOH offices. So in this regard, we do continuously review the trends at mass vaccination sites, private sector assisted sites, to determine which sites can be consolidated. That is, we might take three sites in a particular area and consolidate them into one, like what we would have done with Napa and the paddock of the Savannah, or which sites require expansion. It's basically a variable system, and it's based on supply, demand, and other trends. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Richards. And of course, we continue to keep the population up to date on the different locations where COVID-19 vaccines are available. Let's go to CL Communications, please. Hi, good morning to everyone at the panel. Malik Clark from Caribbean Lifestyle Communications. I just have one question for Dr. Richards. Um, Dr. Richards, Countries around the world are relaxing their mass mandates for the public and testing requirements for travelers. So are we potentially looking to adopt similar changes? Thank you. 
First of all, these countries are considered sovereign states, so they can make decisions for their population um, based on their level of evidence. They can make decisions based on their level of herd immunity. And in a lot of these countries, or in many of these countries, there's a high level of herd immunity. That is a high vaccination uptake. In Trinidad and Tobago, we continue to be guided by the science and the advice given by the World Health Organization. And this is an uncertain and evolving virus. There's a lot of ambiguity regarding variants, regarding the severity of the disease, regarding the you know, effectiveness um, when it comes to secondary reinfection with variants. In this regard, we continue to be guided by the WHO's recommendations which are to wear your mask properly, wash your distance, and wash your hands, even if you are vaccinated and boosted. The concern that you would have identified regarding the testing for entry into our country is a border control measure, and it's one of a national policy, and that decision would be made if, there's to be, if there is to have an amendment by the Honorable Prime Minister and the Cabinet. Thank you very much for your question. Thank you, Dr. Richards, and just a reminder to everyone that we also have Ms. Sukchan here with us who can answer questions, especially related to immunization, and she focused today on vaccination of our children. Let's go to TV6, please. Hi, good morning to everyone on the panel. My two questions. Um, with one week to go before the possible public sector vaccine mandate, um, can anyone give an update as to the, to the new figures of that population? Um, if those numbers have increased since the last data that would have been presented. And the second one has to do with the MMR. Um, can the ministry say, you know, are there specific reasons you all associate with the decline? Um, specifically, what I wanted to focus on is, could it be impacted by the number of babies now being born to Venezuelan mothers? I know in the SWRHA in 2020, 8% of babies there were born to Venezuelan mothers, and we're seeing a decrease of about 10%. Um, could it be maybe that because of that number of um, babies being born to Venezuelan mothers, that maybe there's a lack of understanding or communication to have them come out to vaccinate that population of babies. Thank you. Thank you very much. We'll go to Dr. Richards for response to one, and then to Ms. Sukchan for response to question two, please. So I'll start um, regarding the response to your question pertaining the vaccination rates in our migrant population, that is the Venezuelan population. In compliance with the Ministry of Health's policy on treatment and care for non-nationals, vaccination and all emergency treatments are to be offered free of charge to migrants. I can confirm that out of the County Medical Officers of Health and the primary healthcare centers, and in conjunction with the hospital departments and the maternity units, there is a tracking system to identify births and then even if a mother does not present or does not come in after the required period, whether it's eight weeks or 12 weeks or one year, the nurses uh, make an effort and they would go and do home visiting and they would follow up on that child to ensure that they are vaccinated. I know that Nurse Sukchan can provide more detail um, given her role and her capacity there. Um, the other question, I don't know if you can repeat it, please, regarding the public sector. I just want some clarity on it. Thank you. Sure, no problem. Thanks. Um, given that the um, possible public sector mandate as it relates to vaccination and that law to have that population vaccinated by the 17th, um, ca can you give us some updated numbers? I know in the past we have seen um, the rate by which those um, sectors have been vaccinated. Can we maybe get an update as to if that has increased significantly ahead of the 17th? Thank you for repeating the question. At this point in time, I do not have um, a numerical update, but yet again, this question can be referred to the Corporate Communications Department, and they will provide you with an updated breakdown 
of the vaccination status by ministry and service. Thank you. Thank you. And we go to Ms. Sukchan for response to question two, please. Right. Thank you for that question. And Dr. Richards uh, rightfully answered the first part of the question with respect to how we are aware of the births of the migrant population. Yes, there are laser units in the hospital that link with community, so we get all information of births of babies, whether they are nationals or non-nationals. And yes, we do provide immunization services to that particular population. With respect to our low coverage, however, our estimates of the amount of vaccines required for our population is based on figures we have for our nationals as well. So, in fact, if we did have quite a number of the uh, migrants being vaccinated, our, pop, our percentage would have been over the estimated amount. However, uh, our figures for our children who would have received, in the instance, a uh, second dose of MMR would have been those who would have received the first dose of MMR. And when you look at the amount of children that were not present for their second dose, we know we have quite a gap in our mothers, our parents, our guardians bringing their children out to be vaccinated. So that is definitely our statistics for our local nationals. Thank you very much, Ms. Sukchan. Let's go to ACP News, please. I think we have an additional question from ACP News, yes. so let's give them the opportunity. Hi, yes, so and again from ACP. Um, Dr. Abdul Richards, can you give us any updates regarding if you all had any reports from schools regarding any COVID-19 issues, seeing that school was opened uh, since Monday for more of the population? Thank you. Thank you very much. Information regarding COVID-19 cases in schools will be shared or can be shared if accessed through the Ministry of Education. The Ministry of Health works in conjunction with the Ministry of Education, but they are the line ministry to provide confirmation on these numbers. Thank you. Thank you very much. And now CNC3 Guardian Media Limited, I believe we have an additional question from you. Do we have an additional question? No. Okay. So then I see TV6 yes, has an additional... Oh, well, yes, but we do. Okay. My apologies. Let's go, please, to Guardian <laughs> Media Limited. I'm sorry, Candace. No, that's um, fine. Please, so... please go ahead. We're just sorting through the technology as we go along. Oh, gosh. All of us. Um, <laughs> my second question. We have really loved your video of the back to um, concerts safe zone concert arrangement but un unfortunately while people look socially distant they're not masked so we just wanted to confirm are you supposed to be masked in these safe zone concerts or is it because it's a safe zone you may be allowed to not wear your mask thank you for that question let's go to dr richards please it's a similar concept to the restaurant industry and the safe zones that are applied in restaurants and in movie theaters we always advise persons to wear your mask throughout any sort of event because, of course, in these events, social distancing can be a bit challenging when we are speaking with persons. However, if someone has to eat or drink an item, then obviously your mask comes on. But we do advise persons, once you're not eating and drinking, to please put your mask back on. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for that clarification. Everyone, please wear your mask as much as possible when you're out of your home bubble. Let's go to TV6, please. Hi, and so just my final question. Um, you know, as it relates to Carnival, you know, do you all think it is unwise at this point to have it given that we are noting this decrease in numbers, the hospitals being eased up, um, you know, the Point Portland Hospital coming off, is it wise are you all anticipating that the decline will continue despite we're seeing these um unmasked um people attending these gatherings for carnival and i mean we're not even into the full part of it as yet thank you for the question let's go to dr richards please firstly the decision to host carnival events as part of a safe zone concept was a cabinet decision and that's a policy decision made by the government 
taking several variables into consideration. There are several risk mitigation measures that are being applied to safe zones for carnival events. Um, we would have seen the concept of the pods. We would have seen the compliance with, in terms of vaccinations and so on. We continue to monitor the number of cases per day and more importantly, the number of persons accessing the hospitals because that's the important factor. We don't want to overwhelm the healthcare system. However, given the need for Trinidad and Tobago as other countries to return to a sense of normalcy and given the fact that we are 49.4% 49 fully vaccinated, the Ministry of Health, of course, was part of that decision um, through our Honourable Minister to allow carnival-type activities. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. And AZP News, I think we have another question coming from that media house. So let's go to AZP News online, please. Hi. Um, can you provide any update regarding the pediatric hospital cases? Thank you. And Dr. Richards, uh, would you have that information at hand? Yes, good morning. There are three pediatric cases hospitalized in the parallel healthcare system this morning. Thank you very much. And I think we've come to the end of questions from members of the media. Um, but just as we have a few minutes left, I just want to highlight at this time the weekend vaccination um, locations. I always try to remind the public that if you are at home and anything we've said today has encouraged you or something has encouraged you, you can go out and get vaccinated right now. We have locations that close at 3 p.m. today. If you're in North, then you're going to Paddock, Queens Park, Savannah. You can go to Costat, El Dorado. The Larry Gomes Stadium, which is a walk-in and drive-through. You can go to UTT campus in Shogonas. Of course, we did have vaccination at Sapa today up until 12 noon. Tomorrow, you still have the opportunity to get vaccinated. Tomorrow, the Larry Gomes Stadium is a drive through between 8 to 3 p.m. We thank everyone this morning for taking the time to view the conference today. We had a very important topic, vaccination of our children. Everyone, please remember to protect yourself and your loved ones. Get your children vaccinated and you get your COVID-19 vaccine yourself. Follow the health guidelines as well. Remember, if we all do our part, we can overcome this pandemic. Have a good day, everyone, and be safe. Hi, good morning. My name is Ethla Anthony. I'm an HR officer at the Central Bank of Trinidad and Tobago. Today, I came to